Straight Talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. Hello again, this is Jay Shapiro. Thanks for listening. This week, I will touch upon a number of topics which are important to understand what's happening in Israel and the Jewish world. The first topic is the relationship between Israel and the United Nations. The UN was founded to promote world peace, but has consistently failed in that mission. Two weeks ago, the UN approved five pro-Palestinian and anti-Israel resolutions. This is part of a package of uh, close to 20 anti-Israel resolutions that the UN General Assembly passes every year. No other country has so many resolutions leveled against it. What remains unclear is what exactly these resolutions achieve. Is peace any closer since these votes were held? Of course not. These resolutions achieve only one thing, continued Palestinian intransigence and refusal to come to the table and negotiate with Israel. This is in addition to the really nasty resolution passed against Israel in the waning days of the Obama administration, which the United States did not veto, it abstained. This is important for the incoming Democratic administration to understand. If it returns to the Obama position of condemning and blaming Israel, it will return to hindering any hope for a settlement of the Israel-Palestinian issue. If Trump would have remained in office for another four years, the chances are the Palestinians would have eventually returned to the negotiating table and realized that compromise is important. This will not happen under Biden, so we will probably see a repeat of history leading to no progress with the Palestinians. I'll talk about that. I'll also say a few words about anti-Semitism the measles of humanity, and a few words about recognizing Jewish refugees from Arab countries, which is an important and neglected issue. I'll be back after the break. Thanks again for listening. Israel is located in one of the most volatile areas in the world. Israel is an island of stability and a sea of war and unrest. In the midst of this turmoil, Israel stands out as a beacon of order and human progress. Each week we update you on what's happening in this, the Jewish state, a true light unto the nations. This is Jay Shapiro. Join me every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. Hi, you're back with Jay Shapiro. Since uh, this week is the beginning of Hanukkah, which is the story of the way the Jews rose against their oppressors, I thought it might be an appropriate time to talk about anti-Semitism. It's, it's, it's the world's measles, it's been called. It just doesn't want to go away. Right now, there's something new, social media. And the social media is the most utilized news source for people under the age of 35, And the college campuses, as well as the social media, are two major battlegrounds in the fight against the hatred of Jews. And anti-Semitism is a fancy word. It really means Jew hatred. A lot of radical hate groups, including both the far right and the far left, 
and also Muslim extremists are using these platforms to promote anti-Semitism to the young. And since the young are the most impressionable uh, and have the least background to understand what they're being told, this is very dangerous for the Jews. Although these hate groups, right and left, have very different worldviews and agenda, they all share one thing, which is a hatred of Jews. The radical left and the Muslim extremists have formed a dangerous alliance to spread their anti-Semitism. They cloak Jew hatred under the guise of social justice by attempting to delegitimize the right of the Jewish people to have their own state. In other words, in their eyes, the state of Israel is not legitimate. The BDS movement, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions, is the main promoter of this tactic with the help of group, groups such as Students for Justice in Palestine, which is very active on American campuses. For example, during the latest wave of Black Lives Matter and the latest wave was a protest sparked by the killing of George Floyd, BDS proponents attempted to deceivingly co-opt the Black Lives Movement and shift its indignation against Israel. How did they do this? by falsely claiming that Israel trains American law enforcement in racist and repressive policing tactics. And keep in mind, American uh, uh, law enforcement people come to Israel for training has nothing to do with any kind of uh, philosophy at all. The training simply has to do with something physical. How do you handle riots and so forth? There's no brainwashing by Israel. And, and that, that is the fact. So on social media in the United States, we find them pushing the idea, the false idea, that Israel, which was established only 72 years ago, is a corrupt white colonialist project that promotes and inspires racism in America. This is being pushed on social media and on college campuses. And in the face of such powerful hate campaign, many progressive-oriented young people, including Jews, who have no real Jewish background at all, are given no choice but to move away from, if not stand against, the Jewish state. In other words, the lack of Jewish education among Jewish college students makes them much more susceptible to the propaganda of the anti-Israel and the anti-Jewish crowd. If being a Zionist, which means supporting the right of Jews for self-determination, and, and that really is what a Zionist is, they want to have a home in their biblical homeland, if that uh, is equal in their eyes, to supporting racism, imperialism, police brutality, and all other manners of evil, how can one fight for social justice and be a Zionist at the same time? Accordingly, Jewish students are branded as either a good Jew, one who opposes Israel, or a bad Jew, a Zionist who supports the Jewish state, and if you support the Jewish state, in their eyes, it means you automatically oppose social justice. This twisted reasoning allows detractors to freely attack those who are branded as bad Jew and call it a legitimate criticism of Israel rather than what it really is, anti-Semitism. Now this has real-world consequences for Jewish college students who are being hounded simply for having an affinity for the Jewish homeland. There are many, many cases like this. There are cases where people, uh, to a, woman, a woman at the Cooney Law School had to drop out of school, and there was a case where a woman at the University of Southern California uh, had to uh, give up the presidency of a student group because of this hounding. 
Realizing the danger posed by the BDS movement, the American government recently declared its commitment to counter the global BDS campaign by identifying organizations engaged in anti-Semitic BDS activities, and at the same time, various nonprofit organizations have filed legal complaints about anti-Semitism at American universities with the U.S. Department of Education. Now, although these efforts to combat anti-Semitism are commendable, they are simply not enough. On anti-Semitism online is skyrocketing and social media platforms are allowing this hatred to spread. This whole th idea, social media and online, is a whole new ball game in which the anti-Semites are taking advantage of it to spread their malicious message. A coalition of 145 nonprofit organizations called on Facebook to adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism. It's the H-R-A-W, it's called. It's known that way. It's the Holocaust, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. Uh, Facebook responded with a commitment to look out for anti-Semitism, to refine Facebook policy and consequently, the platform updated its hate speech policy to prohibit content that denies or distorts the Holocaust. And that, that is a good thing. Some progress has been made with Facebook. There are also groups working to make sure that every college and university adopts the IHRA, and again, the IHRA is International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. You have to get used to hearing that abbreviation, IHRA. They're trying to get universities to adopt the definition, particularly those that accept federal funding, because federal funding is a tool, because if they violate the rules set by the federal government vis-a-vis -vis this IHRA, they're going to lose their funding. The tax dollars, American tax dollars, must not contribute to permissive environments or anti-Semitism that stifle and harm Jewish students and keep them keep them from expressing their basic Jewish identity. So you have you have two sides of the coin here. You have Jewish students who really don't know much about their Jewish identity facing organized groups, well-funded, who are attacking them for their Jewish identity. So it's very difficult to defend something where you don't really know much about it. Now, historically, Jews were hated for their religion. Uh, but in the 19th century, they were hated not, not for religion, but rather for race. That's the interesting background of the word anti-Semite. Because in the word Semite, you're defining a race or an area from which the uh, people came or, or originated. It doesn't define religion. So now, first they were, they, they were hated for being Jewish, the religion. The 19th century, as I said, they were hated for their race. And now Jews are being hated for having their own homeland here in Israel. Anti-Zionism is a contemporary form of anti-Semitism. It is as simple as that. So we must fight this hate influence, especially on younger generations. In order to do this is necessary, not only in the, for its own sake to try to get the truth out, but we have to help secure the future of the Jewish people in the United States in Israel, and also around the world. Anti-Semitism is a bad thing, and uh, we have to fight it. There's no two ways about it. And now that uh, we have organi the organizations like Black Lives Matter 
adopting anti-Semitism, it's interesting, you have to ask yourself, what does, what does anti-Semitism have to do with black lives? But the anti-Semitism there, anti-Semitism is very interesting. It can creep into everything. And it takes all kind of forms and it changes each time according to what it needs. That's very unfortunate. I'll be back after the break. The Tamar Yona Show. Tamar? She's sassy. She's smart. She's funny. But she's also a real Jewish mother. Hi, everybody. I'm Tamar Yona. And yes, I can be all of those things. But at Israel News Talk Radio, I'm here to bring you the news stories and guests that you may not hear anywhere else. Join me live on air Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays for the most unique and bold talk radio in Israel. The Tamar Yona Show. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Did you know this psalm and many others were composed by a Jewish shepherd and musician who later became a king? Would you like to know some of the inner meanings of psalms to help you connect with God and strengthen your soul? An exciting and easy to read book is now available, which will help you do just that. Software for the Soul, Psalms for Everyone, available on Kindle, Audible, and Amazon.com. Software for the Soul. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. Hello again, you're back with Jay Shapiro. In the first part of the program, I spoke about uh, anti-Semitism. Now I want to say a few words about uh, the place where anti-Semitism has become embedded on a great scale, which is the U.S. The UN General Assembly. Last week, the United Nations General Assembly approved not one, not two, not three, not four, but five pro-Palestinian and anti-Israeli resolutions. The uh, this is part of a package that uh, the, the United Nations General Assembly passes every year. Uh, no other country has had so many resolutions leveled against it other than Israel. Israel's really the main target, target every year of these resolutions. Now, interestingly enough, the votes were on issues that you can really call obscure, uh, like uh, the, the um, I'll give you an example. There was something called the United Nations Committee for the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights for the Palestinian People. That was uh, the the UN uh, affirmed that. That's with that's a that's a mouthful. Also, another resolution called, and I quote. Special Information Program on the Question of Palestine. Now, these are very interesting titles because you're not really sure what they're saying, but it doesn't matter. The bottom line is they're anti-Israel, which means they're anti-Semitic. What remains unclear is what exactly is achieved by the United Nations passing these resolutions. On the one hand, and this is the most the most uh, you can say about it, they show a tremendous obsession with Israel. The uh, Israel receives attention at the UN unmatched by any other country, but uh, on the other hand, these resolutions do absolutely nothing to advance peace uh, uh, here in Israel or in the Middle East. The uh, The question you have to ask yourself, after these uh, resolutions are passed, and it's every year, is peace any closer since the votes were held? Are the Palestinians incentivized 
to come to negotiating table, which they haven't done for a couple years now. Now that the UN General Assembly has decided to support a resolution of the uh, Division for Palestinian Rights of the Secretariat, and now that the UN has approved that, where are we any closer to peace, or where are we any closer to the Palestinians coming to the negotiating table? The answer is, of course, we're not any closer. These votes and resolution achieve only one thing, and that thing is not good. It is the continued Palestinian intransigence and refusal to come to the table and negotiate with Israel. Regardless of what you believe in terms of a two-state solution, or you don't believe in a two-state solution, or whether Israel should have sovereignty in the entire area west of the Jordan River, it's all immaterial as far as the fact that they refuse to negotiate anything. They refuse to come to the table, and these resolutions give them support. Uh, why is this more important than usual, even though this is an annual ritual? It's more important because there is a new administration coming in to Washington on January 20th. There will be a Democratic administration under Joe Biden. And there already are hints that they're going to go back to the positions of previous Democratic administrations, primarily the Obama administrations, and to re-embrace the path of condemning and blaming Israel for the fact that there's no peace. And obviously it didn't work under Obama, it will not work under Biden. It's very interesting, by the way, I just had as an aside how our prime minister, who has his own problems here in Israel, uh, he's under indictment and all kind of things that are not pleasant, but he's managed for the eight years of the Obama administration to hold out against a, an American administration that was hostile to Israel, probably the most hostile. So uh, we'll never know what would have happened had, had Donald Trump won another term and continue to pressure the Palestinians into accepting the peace plan he rolled out last January. Donald Trump, who really came out of nowhere and did more for getting some kind of peace in the Middle East, or by recognizing the intransigence of the, of the Palestinians, and he went ahead anyway, and working only with Israel. But we'll never know what would have happened. I, I have to assume there, there are things going on that we don't know about that were started by the Trump administration that will probably never come to, to fruition, particularly not under an Obama uh, under a uh, Biden administration. Uh, after eight years of getting their way in Washington under Obama, the Palestinians suddenly didn't get anything they wanted under Trump and they remain at odds with him and with his administration. It's likely that Palestinians would not have been able to hold out for another four years and would have eventually returned to the negotiating table with Israel. Although this time they would have returned with an understanding that compromises would be necessary. So in that sense, since they, since they are not willing to compromise, they simply there was no point in them coming back to the table. The so-called experts tell us that had Trump stayed in office, uh, the um, Palestinians would have to come back to the table and compromise. My own feeling is, and I'm not an expert, is that under the present Palestinian leadership, they will not compromise. It has to be an altogether new and younger leadership that understands that they've been going down the wrong track all these years. Now, the question now is, what will the Biden administration do? It even finds time to restart the, the Palestinian-Israeli peace process. What happened at the UN last week passing this resolution should serve as a reminder of what is not needed. Israelis and Palestinians don't need plans. They don't need resolutions. 
that, and they don't need proposal to look good on paper, and they also don't need academic conferences that have nothing to do with reality, but they make a lot of money for the so-called experts who speak at these conferences and write books. I have a few right here on my desk written by so-called experts, and it's laughable. They, they use the Palestinian-Israeli conflict to make money, not to resolve anything. So uh, the countries that voted in favor of the five anti-Israel resolutions at the United Nations show that they are just as detached from reality uh, and from what's happening here in Israel, the Gaza Strip, and so forth. Moreover, anti-Israel resolutions and meetings of the Security Council, Council are not going to bring the sides together. It hasn't worked since 1948. It will not work. What can work? That's the question. I think what will work is an understanding by the Palestinians that they will not simply get what they want and they'll need to compromise to achieve independence, statehood, and peace if that's what they want. Right now, the only thing they have on their agenda is destroying Israel. And that is not, thank God, not working. So uh, they need, first of all, they need new leadership. A new leadership that's not brainwashed, which is hard to find. Since anybody in, who uh, grew up in, under the Palestinians since the, uh, since the, 19, uh, since the uh, Oslo Agreement, has been educated from kindergarten or pre-kindergarten up that uh, Israel has no right to exist. So it would be nice if the new leadership would take over from this, this old leadership in the Palestinian area. The problem is, what would the new leadership really be like considering the education they've been getting? So that's a, that's a tough situation. The... Uh, Biden will need to make it clear the United States is not going back to the days of Obama. However, Biden might not be capable of doing that. And the uh, Obama refused to veto an anti-Israel resolution in his last few days in office. Does it look up, check out on the internet, look up UN Resolution 2334. It passed at the end of the Obama presidency, and it was really anti-Israel. And if you look at the wording carefully, in a sense, it's also anti-Semitic. And it passed under Obama, whose vice president was Joe Biden. So it's hard to know what Joe Biden will do. I think the best we can hope for is for him to be so busy, caught up in domestic problems, that he won't th think anything about what's happening here in the Middle East. He should have other things on his mind that will keep him busy. So that's, I think that's the best thing to hope for. Hope. The best thing to hope for, I guess, to put it differently, is not that he should help resolve the problem in the Middle East. The best thing is that he should ignore the problem here in the Middle East, take care of his domestic problems. I'll be back after the break. In a time where feelings have become fact, where rational thought and common sense has disappeared, one man stands above it all. I'm Howie Sobaker, your political hitman. Local Hitman airs every Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. North American time, 7 a.m. Israeli time, only on Israel News Talk Radio. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show.
Hi, you're back with Jay Shapiro. In this uh, portion of the program, I want to touch on a, a number of items that I call under the radar. You don't see headlines about them, but I think they're important or important enough for the listeners to know about. First one has to do with the U.S. United States representation here in Israel. For many years, from the founding of the State of Israel until the Trump administration, the American embassy was located in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is not the capital of Israel. The capital of Israel is Jerusalem. But this is Israel is one of the few, if not the only country, I haven't checked, where the American embassy was not in the capital. They had an embassy in Tel Aviv and a consulate in East Jerusalem. So if you lived in Jerusalem, you want to do something of a, of a consular nature, you had to pick yourself up and go to East Jerusalem, which is the Arab part of the city. There is another American office in the western part of the city, but I think that's, that's like a household for spies. Nobody knows exactly what goes on there. At any rate, uh, Trump changed all this. He moved the American embassy to Jerusalem. He closed the consulate in East Jerusalem, in the Arab area. So anybody who wanted to do anything with the American government had to come to the embassy in uh, West Jerusalem, which is about a mile away from where I live, by the way. Big, beautiful building. Now, the United States is planning something new. The United States is planning to make an outreach building in East Jerusalem in order to improve relations with Palestinians and Arabs. Uh, first of all, there was a rumor or media reports that the U.S. was planning to open a consulate in East Jerusalem, uh, but uh, according to the, uh, the embassy's Palestinian Affairs Unit, they do not going to reopen a consulate. Uh, according to the statement of the representative of the Americans, there is one American diplomatic mission in Israel, the U.S. Embassy. It is based in Jerusalem, Israel's capital. That is exactly what a senior embassy official said. Then he went on to say, our plans to open an outreach building in East Jerusalem has been in the works for years, and it is designed solely to improve our contact among our Jerusalem neighbors. It is not a separate consulate, nor does it have the facilities of a consulate, and we have no plans to make a consulate in East Jerusalem. The, the, a consulate, of course, helps provide visas and things of that nature. So according to the uh, spokesman for the Americans, it's an outreach building. I'm not quite sure what an outreach building is supposed to do, but we'll see as it develops. Back in 2019, the Americans merged the consulate in Jerusalem with the embassy in Jerusalem. Therefore, as I said before, it created one center to serve all the residents of the city. The, uh, and that, is, that, that serves the Arabs, the Jews, anybody else. The merging the two was aimed at ensuring that, ensuring that the United, speaks with, United States speaks with one voice to both Israelis and Palestinians, because up until then they were sort of offering mixed messages to, to the Arabs and to the Jews, and now they have one embassy and they're not planning to change that, they're not planning to make a consulate in East Jerusalem, they're they're planning to do outreach, and I don't know exactly what that means, but we'll know once they open it and we see what they do. So it is, it's good that they specifically say they're not opening a consulate. Now I want to touch another subject which is under the radar, and we're very aware of it here in Israel for many years, but it's, it's time that it really come to the surface. There are something like 850,000 Jewish refugees expelled from Arab countries and also from Iran 
when Israel was created back in 1948, for international bodies like the United Nations, these people are forgotten refugees. There's no argument over the facts. After the State of Israel was created in November 1948, the partition plan, Arab countries waged war not only on Israel, the Jewish state, but also against the peaceful and thriving Jewish communities that lived among them. Entire communities from Morocco to Iraq, from Egypt to Syria, Lebanon, Iran, and elsewhere were effectively wiped out. Thousands of years of Jewish heritage, history, and culture were erased. In places like um, Iraq, the Jewish community goes back to the time of the Second Temple, and they were all thrown out within a few days. United Nations offered no help to those people forced to their, from their homes, has done little since to recognize the huge injustice they suffered. There was no international condemnation of the fact that these Jews were attacked, sometimes murdered, their property looted, and their assets stolen, often by their own neighbors and with the backing of the authorities. These, since these treasure, tre, treacherous expulsion, the same time that the Palestinians became refugees, the UN has worked only to assist the so-called Palestinian refugees. Billions of dollars have been handed over to the UN RWA, which while caring for the welfare of families, simultaneously encourages terrorism and incitement to its school programs, and in the process perpetuates a false narrative of the Palestinians' right of return. So there is a moral obligation to right the wrong that was done to these Jews from Arab lands. And Gilad Erdan, Israel's ambassador to the UN, has taken it upon himself to bring this up. He says that he will lead a diplomatic campaign to pass a resolution in the UN General Assembly to recognize the plight of 850,000 Jews and to see that justice is provided for those Jewish communities that have been scorned by the world for more than 70 years. The, it's interesting because the Palestinians even those who, who left their homes because of the war in 1948, some of them left their homes for only a, to move only a few miles, or even less than a few miles, while these Jews, almost a million Jews, were kicked out of countries where they had lived for several thousand years. Peace can only be reached through strength, mutual respect, and recognition of the truth. If the international community is serious about promoting peace between Israel and its neighbors, it must also recognize historical facts, including the trauma of Jews from Arab countries. This a whole new discourse has to be open on this topic. Now, interestingly enough, now that Israel has signed agreements with the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, and perhaps with Sudan, we don't know yet, it's called the Abraham Accords. And the truth of the matter is that this is a source of light for thousands of Jews who still live in Arab countries today. The normalization of ties between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain will encourage Arab leaders, hopefully, to provide their, their own Jewish communities with support, allowing them to practice their own culture openly. So that, that is a whole new ball game that our UN ambassador wants to bring up. It, particularly, it's, it's forgotten. It, it's for, you know, if you speak to Jews here who came from Iraq, and I know many of them, they tell you how they have they had to pack up within a couple of days with two suitcases of their belongings. They left they left everything behind. And now the UN, which recognizes and pours millions into the Palestinian uh, Arab refugees, have to pick up on this. And it's up to our uh, representation 
in the UN, hopefully supported by other countries, to bring this to the attention of the world. This is a festering sore. And a lot of people even here, the younger generation in Israel here, don't, don't really know that much about it. They, they always, when they think about Europe, Jewish refugees, they think about Europe. But a lot of, well, as I said, 850,000 Jews were kicked out of these countries, and there still is a remnant remaining there. And uh, for, actually, it's kind of humorous to now that the uh, United Emirates, United Arab Emirates, have a Chabad house, and I see in the newspaper is people are planning to go there for Hanukkah the holiday which starts this week, so they'll have kosher food when they get there. So all this is very nice. It really is. It's nice. And hopefully these diplomatic relations will spread with other countries in the Arab sphere and in the Muslim sphere. But there is this, as I said, festering sore of Jews from the Arab countries who really were dislocated big time. Something should be done about it. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, sign off. And happy Hanukkah to everyone. Take care. Where can you get the inside news on Israel? At Israel News Talk Radio, we're dedicated to sharing Israel's inside story with the world by providing our listeners with news on Israeli politics, current affairs, and Israeli Jewish culture. The Israel News Talk Radio homepage also provides you, the listener, with useful information at your fingertips with scrolling news headlines, weather, currency exchange, Shabbat candle lighting times, and so much more. Our radio programming is always accessible and on demand. We operate absolutely free of charge for everyone, everywhere. If you love what we do, partner with us now by becoming an Israel News Talk Radio supporter. With your support, you'll be inscribed on our Israel News Talk Radio Wall of Fame. There's nothing like us in the world. Be part of something great. Israel News Talk Radio. Straight talk from Israel. Howdy, this is Rita from Leak City, Texas, now living in Israel. And though my heart may have belonged to Texas, it now belongs to Israel and all the fantastic show hosts at Israel News Talk Radio. Hi, this is Michael Solomon from Kiryat Arba, Israel. And why do I love listening to Israel News Talk Radio? Because I love listening to the interesting interviews they do and their news reporting that most other media sources don't cover. Hey, this is Nicole Eko from Malmo, Sweden. It gets pretty cold here in Sweden, so I love cuddling up with a warm cup of tea while I listen to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, everybody, this is Frank Norris from Tennessee. Me and my dog Buster really love listening to Israel News Talk Radio. <laughs> You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.